Hello, everyone. My name is Jacqueline Durakis, and I am the Expeditions Manager for Earth Echo International. We are so excited to have classrooms from all over the globe joining us today as we learn about plastics in our ocean. This live event is part of our 2018 Expedition Plastic Seas Material Launch. <clears throat> This expedition happened in Australia in October of last year. <laughs> Led by our founder, Philippe Cousteau Jr., we brought educators to the front lines of Australia's unique ecosystems to look at the impact of litter and microplastics on the organisms that call Australia home. And please enjoy this short trailer. Earth Echo has set off on an expedition with school teachers to Melbourne, Australia, to look at the impacts of plastics in the marine environment. We'll see how plastics are damaging our beaches. I collected this about a week ago, and this is the sort of stuff that is coming down the creek. Oceans. We spend much of our time on the water actually picking up things like balloons or plastic bags. And threatening the wildlife we cherish so much. One of my most heart-wrenching experiences was seeing our beloved weedy sea dragon stuck in a shopping bag. Our team will talk with experts who are using innovative techniques to track the problem. Through looking at seabird vomit. Seabird vomit. Delightful. We'll see youth taking the lead in extraordinary ways and spend time with those who are engineering solutions for the future. This is about behaviour change, and with knowledge and education and technology, this is a solvable issue. I'm Philippe Cousteau. Join me and tune in to Earth Echo Expedition's Plastic Seas. Great, so as part of our Plastic Sea resources, we have four expedition videos that highlight our plastic journey and are hosted by Philippe Cousteau. We also have a series of STEM career close-up videos that highlight the experts that we met in Australia. In addition, we have a series of youth in action videos that highlight amazing young people and the work that they are doing in their communities to fight ocean plastic. And last, but certainly not least, the 25 teachers that joined us on Expedition Plastic Seas are now Expedition Fellows and have been working for the past three months to make STEM lessons come to life for teachers around the world. These lessons include learning about a product's life cycle to a STEM design challenge on creating a Nurdle capture device and lots more. So head over to our website after this event and make sure to download these resources for free thanks to our presenting sponsor, the Northrop Grumman Foundation. We would also like to thank all of the amazing partners that made Expedition Plastic Seas happen. Now I'd like to introduce our live interactive classrooms that we have on with us today. So first we're gonna head to Whitehall Middle School in Michigan and say hello to Mrs. Tate's class. Hi everybody. You guys wanna wave, say hi, there we go. We'll come back and get questions from you in just a little bit, okay? And then we have Mrs. Goulet's class which is called Growing Awareness in All. And they are coming to us live from McNichol Middle School in Miramar, Florida. Hi, everybody. It's so great to have you with us today, and we will come back to you with questions. So before we get started today, we have a little bit of housekeeping to go over. So we love participation from everybody watching, not just our live classrooms. So if you're watching from home on YouTube, you can use the question and answer app that is uh, the chat that's right below. And if you're watching on earthecho.org, there is, there is a Google form where you can add, enter your questions. Please go ahead and post questions now or at any point during this live event. Um, we will be answering questions in a few spots during the event. And then we also have set aside time at the end for those additional questions and answers. But for now, let's get started. Please join me in welcoming our special guest and host for today's event, Miss Megan Schifoletti. She is the Conservation and Education Director at Trilogy Excur Excursions, and she is coming to us live from Maui, Hawaii. Good morning, Megan. Go ahead and take it away. Good morning, Jacqueline. Thanks so much for joining me today, everybody. I'm really excited to be here. So as Jacqueline said, my name is Megan Schiffaletti, and I am the Conservation and Education Director for Trilogy Excursions. Trilogy Excursions is located here on the island of Maui, and we are an ecotourism catamaran company. 
So part of my job with them is to run our Blue Ina campaign. Now, the Blue Ina campaign is Trilogy's Give Back program. And the first Sunday of every month, we go out on one of our catamarans and we conduct an underwater reef cleanup. Part of my other job as education coordinator is I get to educate my staff how to be onboard naturalists. So throughout the year, I give presentations on different topics such as oceanography, um, invertebrate biology, marine mammals, fish ID, sea turtles. That way our staff have the knowledge and feel comfortable talking and interacting with our guests on board the boat and describing the environment that they're around. Now, when I'm not in the I get to get out of the office and on the boat enjoying this beautiful island of Maui as well. So let's jump right into it, guys. The title of this presentation is Eat Less Plastic, and that's exactly what's happening. That's becoming normal now for animals and for humans to be eating plastic. We're finding plastic in whales, in the stomachs of fish, and sea turtles, seabirds, right? And even us. So even if you didn't know you were eating plastic, it's in our systems, unfortunately. Now, this is really bad, right? We're not supposed to be eating plastic. But let's first learn a little bit about what plastic is before we get into why it's so bad for us. Plast plastic first came about in the 1950s as a cheap, throwaway, easy to use product that was starting to replace reusable products. So at the time we didn't realize, I don't think how much we were gonna to come to rely on plastic and how much we were going to use it. Now plastic itself is an actual, is a chain of molecules. And these chains of molecules are called polymers. And the polymers are made out of things like carbon and hydrogen and sometimes phosphorus and oxygen and all of these other um, elements linked together. Now one of the really bad things about plastic is that it never goes away. Instead of biodegrading, what happens is it photodegrades, where in the sunlight it breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces. So every single piece of plastic ever made is still in existence today. So that's a lot of plastic on the earth, right? And eventually that plastic finds its way into the oceans. And so as the water in our oceans is circulating around the globe, it's going to start circulating into these five main gyres. So we've got the Indian Ocean gyre, the North Pacific, the South Pacific, the North Atlantic, and the South Atlantic gyre. And as this water is circulating and moving through the ocean, it's carrying that plastic and that trash with it and that plastic starts to accumulate into certain areas. So these accumulations of plastic, we now call garbage patches. And every single one of these five gyres has its own garbage patch associated with it. Now you may be familiar with the Great Pacific garbage patch, the, the really popular one that everybody talks about. And it is the largest trash accumulation out of these five gyres. And it's located, as the name implies, in the North Pacific, off the coast of California in between Hawaii. Now, this area of trash doesn't just stay right there, but it kind of circulates around in this general area. Now, it's supposed to be about the size of two Texas states next to each other. So that's a pretty large area that this plastic is encompassing. And it, I've heard it been termed as to a floating plastic island. And that's actually a bit of a misconception. It's not an actual island that you can walk on. As you can see on the right-hand side in this chart, there is a higher concentration of plastic in the middle of the garbage patch, and then it starts to spread out over a larger area. But it's not an actual floating island of trash that you can go visit on your next vacation. Um, it's, it's more of a, a haze of plastic throughout the entire water column that you would just be floating through. So plastic, remember, it continuously breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces. It never actually goes away. And these really small pieces of plastic are termed microplastic. So that's going to be pieces of plastic that are five millimeters or smaller. So to kind of put that into perspective, it's about the size of your pinky nail or smaller than that. Those are what microplastic is going to be. 
a study done by five gyres and other scientists in 2014 found that there was an estimated 5.25 trillion pieces of plastic floating around our world's oceans. That's so much plastic. That's absurd. And so we've got this massive amount of plastic floating around in our oceans. Well, what happens next? Well, marine animals and marine organisms start to interact with it. And that's where things can get really interesting. There is a company here on Maui called Shark Astics. It's the word shark and plastics put together and they conduct beach cleanups and they're specifically looking for pieces of plastic that have bite marks taken out of them. Now these bite marks aren't just from sharks, but they're from other marine animals as well, such as the fish, the sea turtles, and the birds. And so that right there is evidence that marine animals are biting the plastic and potentially ingesting it. So what do you guys think, Mrs. Tate's class, why do you guys think these animals are biting this plastic? What would, why would they go after plastic instead of something else delicious? Um, they think it's food. Yeah, exactly. It's that simple, right? The, the pieces of plastic look just like food. And so these animals don't know the difference. They're just going to go after it. So take a plastic bag, for example. Plastic bag could look like jellyfish or like a piece of algae floating in the water. And sea turtles love eating jellyfish and algae. So that turtle doesn't know that that's not a delicious jellyfish. So it's going to go and try to eat it. And then it accidentally ingests this plastic. So we've got um, so we've got animals eating plastic. Now remember, as I mentioned earlier, this plastic photodegrades down into smaller and smaller pieces of microplastic. And I've got an image up here for you to see on to scale of a penny with the microplastic next to it. And this is an actual sample that we collected on our Eat Less Plastic voyage. And you can see I've circled two pieces of microplastic there. So we're talking really, really tiny, tiny things here, right? Now these really tiny pieces are what we're interested in learning more about because these microplastics look like plankton. And plankton is at the bottom of our food chain, at the bottom of our food web. And as smaller fish eat the plankton and the larger fish eat the smaller fish, this, these microplastics are going to biomagnify up the food chain till we get to our top predators and even to our humans. And then we've got plastic in our systems. Now, the harmful effects that plastic could have on us, there's still a lot of study being done about that. But it can't be good, right? We're not supposed to be eating plastic. So more research is ongoing as we speak looking at to exactly what harmful effects plastic is having on us. But the other thing about plastics is plastics absorb toxic chemicals. And as that plastic starts to break down, it can release those chemicals into our bodies and into the bodies of the animals that it's in as well. So like I said, probably not good things coming from us ingesting plastic. So what can you guys do about it? Well, this is everybody's problem. It's not just people that live on islands or in coastal communities. Um, this plastic problem is, it belongs to everybody. A study done in 2017 found that 95% of plastic in the ocean came from land. So through, uh, by the wind and runoff from rainstorms in large cities, this plastic makes its way into our streams and river systems and then it flows downstream from land and empties out into the ocean. So even if you're in Michigan in a landlocked state, I grew up in Illinois, your plastic habits do have an impact on the entire world. So this brings me to Eat Less Plastic. This was a voyage that I was able to join back in September. It was a voyage that started in Los Angeles and sailed all the way to New Zealand, making uh, stops at different islands along the way. The entire voyage took to the date exactly six months to complete, and the boat sailed just over 8,000 miles. 
So I've got a little video for you guys that shows our captain, Phil Somerville, um, giving you guys a little bit more detail about what the Eat Less Plastic Voyage was all about. Good to go. Yeah, I guess you could say my life revolves around the Pacific Ocean. I mean, I grew up on the very edge of it, in the tiny country of New Zealand. And now I live on the other side, the famous part, <laughs> Malibu, Marina del Rey. Over more decades than I'd like to admit, I've watched this ocean get sick. It's marine life deplete and plastic baking in the sun pollution. To put it into perspective, guys, 8 million tons of plastic trash gets dumped into the ocean every year. And there's an estimated 240 million tons of plastic waste in our oceans. To get home, I'm crossing this mighty ocean, the biggest ocean in the world, to literally test its health. LoveTheSea.org, among others, is providing me with equipment required to measure one of the biggest threats to our ocean, plastic particles. Simply put, it's killing dolphins, whales, fish, turtles, and many more. Almost every living marine creature in our oceans are now affected, even the birds that fly above us. It's in our ecosystem, guys. It's in our food chain. So therefore, we too are literally eating plastic. So I've decided to do something about it. We'll be taking this vessel today through areas of the Pacific Ocean where the level of plastic pollution is virtually unknown. We'll be seeing the fallout of this pollution on tiny, vulnerable communities who are threatened by the rampant production, consumption, and disposal of plastic goods in the Western world. Together, we'll be putting our bodies on the line to explore and report what's happening in our oceans. We will also help spread solutions to you and others, including corporate entities and countries, and assist them in changing their old ways for better ones. Solutions that will only make a positive impact on this planet and our oceans. To put together a successful Pacific voyage, we will need to outfit this boat with necessary safety equipment, but also cover all running costs to go the 12,000 mile distance that's required. And uh, you'll be part of a, hopefully a life-changing solution and platform to bring awareness globally to the plastic pollution. Collectively, consciously as humans, we have a duty, a responsibility to leave this planet in better shape than we found it. So please help us help our oceans, save our ecosystem, and in doing so, save ourselves. Great. So pretty amazing voyage and thing to be a part of, right? And I didn't do the entire voyage. I jumped on board in Tonga in, back in September and sailed from Tonga to Fiji and then from Fiji onward to New Zealand. So the photo here on the left-hand side shows the boat today. The name of the boat is called Today. It's a 54-foot monohull sailboat. And then you can see some of the crew. Throughout the entire voyage, Eat Less Plastic had 24 different crew members that jumped off and on board the boat as it made its way through the South Pacific. Now, so the mission of Eat Less Plastic, we had two main goals that we wanted to accomplish. One, we wanted to sample <clears throat> microplastics throughout the South Pacific in areas where they either hadn't been sampled before or very little data had been collected. And then secondly, we also wanted to reach out and to interact with these local island communities. And we wanted to learn from them and to speak to them and the students and the cultural advisors and the nonprofit groups on those islands and, and learn how they're combating the plastic problem on their own island and what are some of the positive ways that they're doing to fix it. So let's start with the first mission, sampling microplastics. How do you collect a sample of plastic that's smaller than your pinky nail in the middle of the ocean? Well, we did it with a device called a mantatrol. 
And the manta trawl, just as the name, just as a manta will filter water and plankton into its mouth, the manta trawl will filter a surface water sample into the collection net. So it's a device that's about five to five and a half feet tall, and it weighs just under 20 pounds. So it's quite a large device for us to, to carry around and to deploy over the side of the boat. And you can see that we have to rig the boat up so that we can drag the device alongside of the boat. And the device has to stay at the surface of the water. So lots of different lines involved. It's a big coordinated effort from all of the crew to get the manta um, properly over the side of the boat and in the water collecting the sample. We'll slow the boat down to about three um, knots. So the boat has to be going pretty slow and we can't have any uh, strong winds or currents um, or storm events happening that manta trawl we really need to make sure that it's being pulled evenly along the surface of the water. We'll collect a sample for an hour and then we'll pull that manta trawl back on board the boat. Now once the manta is back on board the boat is where the fun part for me begins and that's actually analyzing the sample. So we'll dump that collection tube into a sifter and using a king eye good pair of tweezers and hopefully a magnifying glass, you can start to pick through the entire sample, pulling out any plastic that you might find. Now, this is a lot more difficult than it sounds because some samples were just full of algae and organic matter, pieces of wood, um, and we have to sift, sift through every single little piece so that we didn't miss a, potentially a piece of plastic. Now, one of the samples that I collected off the coast of New Zealand, so we were in slightly colder waters, it had a lot of jellyfish in it. And specifically, it had a handful of Portuguese man o' war jellyfish, I believe five to be exact. And I saw them floating in the ocean before we deployed the manta trawl, but there weren't that many of them. And I was like, oh, I think it'll be okay. Well, after an hour of collecting the sample, we pulled it back up, and the collection tube was just chock full jellyfish and there were like blue tentacles everywhere and I'm looking at it like this is not going to be fun I'm definitely gonna get stung I'm gonna get stung by a jellyfish today it's fine <laughs> I've been stung before and it's not a big deal but I wasn't looking forward to it so luckily the outcome of that I didn't get stung no one else got stung on board the boat we were able to release the jellyfish back into the water and then this is what we found so this graph paper here is five millimeters in diameter. So remember, we're looking specifically for pieces of plastic that are smaller than five millimeters, so that will fit inside the grid. And then you can see that most of the pieces of plastic that we did find do fit within inside of that five millimeter grid. The sample there on the left, we had eight pieces of plastic. And the sample on the right, we had four. The one sample that we found the most pieces of plastic is we found 10 pieces of plastic in one sample. And that's a lot more than I thought we were going to find. Out of the 14 trawls that we did from LA to New Zealand, 13 of them had plastic in them. And now I knew that there was a lot of plastic in the ocean, but I didn't actually realize how much. And it was really eye-opening for me to actually do these manta trawls and to find the plastic myself and to pull it out of the collection tube and, and to analyze it and to start looking at these numbers. So you can see we break the plastics down into different types. We've got fragment, line, pellet, and film. And then the majority of the plastic that we found was fragmented pieces. 92% of all of our um, pieces were fragments. And then um, a few from the lines and pellets as well. Now, with this data, once it's all collected and put onto the data sheet, we take the start and stop time of the sample, our latitude and longitude. We analyze the sea state, if there's any wind, if there's any current. We have this whole data sheet that we fill out, and then we take photos of the samples. And then we send all that data back to five gyres where they analyze it and they add it to their global estimate of marine plastic pollution. So remember that 5.25 trillion pieces of plastic number that I threw out at you guys at the beginning of this presentation? 
that's where that number came from, was in 2014, five gyres took all of the microplastic data and they got that 5.25 trillion number. So this is an ongoing thing. They need more data so that we can update that uh, global estimate of marine plastic pollution. Because right, we're in 2019 now. It's been a couple of years. There's probably more plastic in the ocean than there was back in 2014. Do you guys have any questions about how we collected the data or sampled it um, or what we do with it um, before we get too much further? Great, Megan. Thank you so much. Um, I have a, a question before we head over to our classrooms um, that came in from online. Um, we have a question if, and we were wondering if you, uh, someone from YouTube was wondering if you could explain what a gyre is one more time. Uh, yes. So a gyre uh, just describes a move, the movement of water circulates around the globe and it moves in this circular motion. The northern hemisphere, it moves in a clockwise direction and it just circulates around in this clockwise direction. So that's called a gyre, this movement of water in this circular pattern. And so there are five of those in our oceans, but when you speak of five gyres, you're talking about an additional nonprofit, correct, that you work with? Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah, so make a little clarification there. So there are five main gyres in the ocean itself in those main oceans, but then there's a nonprofit that's called Five Gyres that helps us collect and analyze all of this data and Eat Less Plastic partnered up with them in order to do this mission. So sorry for the confusion there. No worries, thank you so much. That was great, perfect clarification. So we're gonna to go to Mrs. Goulet's class first in Miramar, Florida. Would you guys like to unmute and ask a question or two? You got it. How did you get people to actually join what you're, um, the voyage? Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. In so I'm sorry, I only caught the first half of the question. How did we get people to join the voyage? It was, and what? And how did you get um, those who aren't on the voyage to actually care to help you guys? That's a great question. And how did we get people to actually care? That's a really great question. Well, a lot of people that came on the voyage already cared. They were already doing something about it through their work or in their own lives. They were already aware of the problem and they already wanted to do something more to help out. And when the Eat Less Plastic Voyage started, this was a way for people like myself to do something about it, you know, to do something about it greater than here on my island home of Maui. And so they sent out crew calls which is just through social media and through the website. It's just a call for volunteers who want to be a part of this mission and who want to be on board the boat. So you don't need to know how to sail. You don't need to know basically anything about boats. You just have to want to give back and want to help out and be willing to learn and be willing to live in a really tiny space with a handful of strangers um, who you're going to get to know really, really quick. And so we were all just volunteers. Some of us were friends of the captain or affiliated with some of the other nonprofits like Love the Sea or Five Gyres um, that were involved. And that's how I heard about it was through some friends. And uh, luckily, my work trilogy gave me the okay to take a month and a half off of work and to go play around in the South Pacific. <laughs> That's awesome. So uh, we'll take one more question from YouTube before we head over to your class, Mrs. Tate. Um, and we have a question that's coming in with, um, what do you do with all the plastic samples that you collect? So they're sent to five gyres, but then what happens to that plastic? So we just send photos of the plastic to five gyres. Um, we don't keep the samples. We would um, properly dispose of the samples in a recycling bin or in a trash can. And then any of that organic matter and jellyfish that we caught in the samples, we would put back into the ocean. Awesome. Thank you so much. Mrs. Tate, does your class have some questions for us and for Megan? Hi, yes, we have two students who have questions. So first up, there's Kaya. Are you guys planning to go on another voyage soon? Are we planning to go on another voyage? 
Um, yes, we are. Our first voyage, we just landed in New Zealand on November 14th. So we literally just got back and are getting back into the swing of our daily lives. And throughout the entire trip from LA to New Zealand, we filmed and documented the entire voyage. And so what we're doing now is a lot of follow-up and a lot of post-production. We're going to take all of this footage that we filmed and we're going to make it into short informational documentaries for you guys, for students and for different nonprofit groups and companies so that we can share what we learned with you guys. We also want to make some virtual reality episodes so that you guys can put on those Oculus viewfinders and you can actually be on the boat with us and move around like you're right there with us collecting a microplastic sample or when we're uh, on one of the islands, you can be right there with us conducting a beach cleanup. So is there going to be another voyage? Yes, there will be another voyage, but probably not until 2020. We're going to spend 2019 focusing on doing something with all this really great footage that we've been able to collect. Thank you. Uh, and one more question here. Why can't you use the man patrol underwater? Why can't we use it underwater? Yeah. So the way that it's designed is to be drug along the surface. Now there is plastic throughout the entire water column, but plastic generally floats, right? So a surface sample is going to be the easiest way to collect the plastic and then to analyze it. Because if you're collecting plastic that's not on the surface, then you have to monitor the depth that you've collected it at as well. And imagine towing something alongside a boat and keeping it at a specific depth is pretty hard to do. Um, and so the surface sample is just the easiest way that we're able to collect it and then to analyze it. Great, yeah. thank you so much. Um, and just so you guys know, in our uh, the expedition videos for Earth Echo, we used a, plas a manta trawl to look for plastics as well. Um, so you can look for that in our videos on our website. Uh, I'm gonna go back to Mrs. Goulet's class. They have one more question before we get back into the presentation, okay? And thank you, Mrs. Tate's class. Okay, our, our question was if there is already a machine out there that is already picking up plastic besides the, 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 the mantle. The manta, yeah, there is. It's called the Ocean Cleanup Array, and it was invented by a high school student a couple of years ago. I believe he's 21 or 22 year old, uh, years old now. His name is Boyan Slat, and he invented this device similar to a manta it's got long booms that float at the surface of the water and extend for miles out in either direction and then there's um, a collection container holding device in the very middle of it so it's a stationary um, device and the water in the plastic and the trash gets filtered down into the collection chamber and then it gets brought on board and analyzed that way so this is a brand new um, piece of device that was just invented and they're still trialing it out. They just launched their first one, I want to say a month, maybe two months ago, um, off the coast of California. And I just heard that they unfortunately had a problem with it. A piece of the booms, one of the booms, one of the arms broke free and was floating free. So they unfortunately had to dismantle it and tow it back to California for repairs. But there are things for collecting trash out there in the out there in the ocean that are being used and more and more are being invented every single day. So something for you guys to focus on in the future, you know, the answers for solving this plastic problem maybe aren't even invented yet. So you need to get inspired and to put your thinking caps on and to come up with some solutions for us. We have, another, we have another question. Okay, go ahead. So, um, our other question was, is there any current data right now on how plastic is affecting um, any, any of the food webs or food chains of the ocean? Is there any data um, out there of proof of that? Yeah, so, 
So we know that plastic absorbs toxic chemicals, right? Like PCBs and DDTs. And then as that plastic breaks down in the sunlight or in our bodies, it's gonna release those chemicals into our bodies. So some of the studies that I was able to get my hands on talked about how these chemicals in plastic um, can lead to um, disrupting our hormones, thyroid problems, and a few other health issues as well. Now, all of these studies on the health effects that plastic could have are all is still ongoing. There isn't a lot of information out there, but what we do know is that we do know that these toxic chemicals that the plastic can absorb and the chemicals that are in plastic are harmful. So now scientists are looking at how that is specifically affecting humans and whales and fish as well. Now you can imagine it's pretty hard to determine specific effects from one chemical in your body. So it's an, it's an ongoing issue, but you know, just think about it. It, it can't. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you so much. And great questions, guys. Um, Megan, just one more thing I wanted to add on is, you know, with the Ocean Cleanup Project, one of the things that we talk about a lot with Earth Echo is being an engineer. And sometimes you engineer something and it works and sometimes it doesn't. And then you go back and you re-engineer and try it again. So, you know, we hope that that uh, will, will work for that, that project as well. So let's go ahead and um, move on. Thank you so much for your questions, guys. And uh, we'll let Megan wrap up her presentation here. Thanks, Jack. And those are some really great question, guys. And there'll be some more time uh, here in a couple of minutes for you guys to ask any more that you might have. So the second mission of Eat Less Plastic was to interact with these local island communities and to hear and learn from them about their plastic problem and then to learn ways and positive changes that they're doing to fix it. So throughout the Eat Less Plastic voyage, the crew was able to meet with 16 nonprofits, 13 groups, 10 schools, and to conduct five beach cleanups. Now, one of the schools that the crew met with was in Rotonga in the Cook Islands. Now, prior to meeting with Elas Plastic, this school had already committed to one day a week being plastic free. And after hearing from the Elas Plastic crew and talking with them and learning more um, about this issue, the entire school committed to going plastic free every single day of the week. So that was really inspiring to see these kids uh, really want to make a difference and for them to implement it throughout their entire school. One of the beach cleanups we were able to be a part of was in Tahiti. It was the largest cleanup that that area had ever seen. It was six different cleanups happening on six different islands all at the same time. And that was really amazing to see these different island communities all coming together for the same cause at the same exact time and focusing all of their efforts on this one plastic issue. Another beach cleanup that I was uh, able to be a part of was in Fiji. We had around 150 volunteers show up on the beach and we were able to collect about 1,500 pounds of trash in just a few short hours. So that is a lot of trash that was on this beach and it really did take every single one of us um, working those those entire few hours to, to pick up all of that trash so that was really great to see as well some other positive things that are happening here on the island of maui where i live and that i get to be a part of throughout the entire year is the blue island campaign mentioned it a little bit earlier and so this is the way for trilogy to give back to the community and the first sunday of every month i get to fill up a catamaran with 60 volunteers and we get to go to a local reef and conduct an underwater reef cleanup so before we even get on the boat just there in the harbor we'll do a land-based cleanup kind of as people are showing up and getting checked in and this is where we find a good portion of our trash we'll find bags and bags of trash just right there in the harbor at the check-in. Now there's trash cans in the harbor. There's no excuse for this trash and for this plastic to be on the ground, um, but it is. And so we really want to clean up the areas that we're using every single day. Once we get on board the boat, we travel to a local reef and then we snorkel and free dive down and we pick up any plastic or other marine debris that we might find. 
So we're in the water for about an hour, and a lot of the stuff that we find is single-use plastics, such as forks, straws, plastic cups, bags, saran wrap. We'll find hair ties, lots and lots of fishing line because we're snorkeling along the coastline. So we find lots of fishing line, lead weights, hooks, and then some of the bigger things that we find are bigger fragments of plastic that have been broken off from a, a container or from a buoy. I think in, uh, we even found a kayak paddle once. The coolest or the most random thing that I ever found on a Blue Liner Reef cleanup was a car battery. It was in about 30 feet of water. I have no idea how it got there. It looked relatively new. Um, and car batteries are pretty heavy, so it, it took a few of us to swim it up to the surface and to get it back on board the boat. So we really do find a wide range of things. And a lot of these things have been in the ocean for quite some time. There's lots of fouling organisms on them, like barnacles, algae's already starting to grow, um, and things like that. So Blue Line has been running since 2010. And since then, we've conducted around 78 cleanups and removed over 3,000 pounds of trash from the ocean. So it's a really amazing program that I get to be a part of and that I get to coordinate and organize. And so I've given you guys some examples of what you can do and what other communities are doing. Now, you guys need to start thinking about what you can do yourself, in your home, in your school. It doesn't matter how big or small it is. Just do something about it. Take action. Get involved. And so there's one more video that I want to show you guys that really summarizes up what Eat Less Plastic and what myself and Blue Wina are kind of all about and what we're trying to accomplish. We're out here on a mission. It's called Eat Less Plastic. Uh, we've been inspired by so many people along the way. It's just been unbelievable. Uh, you know, the French Polynesian people are beautiful people. They get it. Uh, they understand the fallout that plastic's having. They don't like it, uh, neither do we. Uh, we have to do something about it. That's, that's why we're out here. We're bringing awareness and uh, we'd love to bring it through the children. We've met so many amazing kids. It's just been inspirational to hear their view on it and their simplicity about what we must do to stop it. And, uh, you know, that's, that's something you want to think about. Through the children is, is the way for me it has to happen. You know, the kids are, are the new generation and they need to know about this. And if we can give them the tools to teach each other and to teach us as adults, I think we'll go a long way in stopping this uh, fight of single-use plastics globally. And uh, that is my goal. So we're doing that. Great, Megan, that's so awesome. So we are getting a little close on time. So if you don't mind, um, we're going to go to uh, some more questions. Um, we have a couple questions coming in from YouTube. And um, I'm going to ask two of them uh, at once, if that's OK. And then we'll go back to our classrooms. So the first one is, how do we influence the world to stop putting plastic in the ocean? And then the second one is, do you know if uh, the ways that we dispose of plastic, for example, here in the U.S. or in Hawaii, um, is part of the problem? So is, is there something that we're missing in our trash disposal that causes that plastic to eventually make its way to the ocean? Yeah, so first, how do we influence the world to care? That's a really good and big question and there's so many different answers to it for me it it just starts with the individual you know we have to show people that this problem affects everybody that nobody can hide from it it's everybody's problem and we have to create that behavioral change which within individual people so that's the hardest part of my job is how do I make people care about something and I think through sharing knowledge and sharing experiences and just talking about it is a really great start to opening up their eyes to, to what the issue actually is. And then providing ways for them to get involved, really simple ways. You know, you don't have to create an 
ocean cleanup array that goes off the coast of California, there's really small things that you can do as an individual in your everyday lives that will make a really big change over time. So start small and all those small changes will all add up over time into something big. So refusing plastic straws when you go out to eat is probably the easiest thing for everybody to do. Um, reusable straws, those metal straws, they even make a collapsible metal straw now. Those are becoming really cool. I'm starting to see those everywhere. We get a lot of tourists that will come on board our boat and will use their own reusable straw when they drink our soft drinks. So creating that behavioral change um, is the main part of my job and it's definitely one of the hardest parts of my job as well. And then the I think that is true, Megan. I just want to add in that I, I agree with you completely. And I think, like you said, it, it also is a uh, baby step. So we don't you don't have to become plastic free overnight. Start with one thing, like you said, a straw. Or maybe um, you students watching out there, start bringing your own water bottle to school every day and don't take that plastic one from the cafeteria. Every action that we make, even though it may seem small, really does make a difference. Yeah. What was the second part again, Jacqueline? The second question was about how we dispose of our trash here in the US and is that affecting plastic getting to the ocean? Yeah, so if you have the ability to recycle in your hometown, it's really great to that. But what happens is it's when the trash isn't properly disposed of and when that plastic isn't properly disposed of once it leaves your hands, some of that plastic that's in the recycling bin doesn't actually get recycled. I know a lot of countries have just increased their standards for the types of recyclables that they're going to collect from the United States and from other nations. And so that's a problem that we're facing now is we don't have anywhere to send our recyclables. So they're kind of just sitting in holding facilities. But then the other way is say you have a trash can without a lid on it outside and a big gust of wind comes up, right? That's probably the easiest way that even that trash is gonna blow out of that trash can or that plastic bottle will blow out of that trash can and onto the ground. And then just through forces of nature, maybe a big rainstorm comes and all that water washes off uh, and washes that plastic bottle down into a drain and then that plastic bottle will eventually make its way into the river system and into the ocean. So there's a handful of different ways that this plastic can enter um, the oceans. And unfortunately, as a consumer, you just have to do your part, you know, make sure that you recycle as much of the plastic that you can, but better yet, just rethink what you buy. You need to stop buying plastic in the first place. There's a lot of really great alternatives out there that are reusable. So start thinking about that, you know, we're so used to um, recycling, but now we need to rethink, we need to refuse, we need to reuse, and then we need to recycle. That's so great, thank you so much. Um, we had one more question that came in online, and that is, um, is the plastic collected from the surface of the ocean just the tip of the iceberg, so to say. So is there a lot more plastic maybe on the ocean floor or is it in the water column? Um, or do you collect it mostly at the surface? So there is plastic throughout the entire water column. There's some really great studies that are analyzing plastic that have sunk and are on the ocean floor. So it's not just at the surface, um, it's just the easiest easiest for us to collect those plastic surface samples. And like I said, most of that plastic does float, right? But over time, once it's been in the water for a while, you've got barnacles starting to grow on it, maybe it gets tangled into something else, some other piece of trash, and then eventually it could sink. So we do have plastic throughout the entire water column, even on the deepest parts of our ocean floors. All right. Um, Mrs. Goulet, do you have any other questions? Uh, I think we're good. Any anyone else? No. No. All right. Thanks, guys. Right. Okay. Mrs. Tate. Mrs. Tate. Um, we had a couple of questions, but I think what we'll do is we, if it's okay, we can we email Megan our questions later. 
Yeah, that is totally okay. Um, actually, our next slide is going to be Megan's uh, information. So just make sure you check that out. Thank you. And thank you guys for joining us today. All right, Megan, so we have one more question that came in from YouTube, and that is, how much data do you think you would need in order to create a bill against plastic pollution? Ooh, good question. Um, well, you can never have too much data, which is why we're continually collecting it. And I think it doesn't necessarily matter how much data you have, but it's what you're able to get out of that data. So if you're able to use that data in a way that can show the problem and then you can put forth a solution to it through a bill or through a ban, well then that data has served its purpose, right? So you don't necessarily need a lot of data, but you just need that data to be good data and to be sound data. It needs to be collected properly. You need to be able to back it up with resources. Now, we're continually collecting this data because everything is changing, right? We're in a dynamic environment, and just the more data that we have, this gives us a better understanding of what's actually happening, and then that will allow us to propose better bills and better bans. Great, great answer, and great question. All right, Megan, would you like to go over how our people watching, um, students and viewers, can contact you? Yeah, guys, so I put up kind of all of my contact details there for you. On one side, we've got the Eat Less Plastic um, website, social media links, and that um, Gmail account. And then on the other side, we've got our Trilogy and our Blue Ina um, information and contacts as well. So the best way to keep up with us is Blue Ina and Eat Less Plastic. We both send out monthly newsletters, and we update our website uh, on an ongoing basis. So just follow us on social media, check out our websites, get involved any way you can, and yeah, just share this knowledge and this message with your parents, with your other friends, just share it far and wide, tell people about it. Great, thank you so much. So before we wrap up today, I just wanted to remind everyone about our exciting uh, Earth Echo Expedition Plastic Seas materials that are now live on our website. Again, we have four exciting videos hosted by Philippe that document our plastic journey in Australia. We also have a series of STEM career close-up videos that look at the experts and talk to them um, about their jobs that we met on expedition. We also have youth in action videos that highlight young people, just like all of you watching, who are doing wonderful things in their community, specifically in Australia for this one, to fight the plastic problem. And of course, last but not least, our teacher resources, which are made by our teacher fellows for teachers. And they are available to download for free, thanks to our presenting sponsor, the Northrop Grumman Foundation. And we couldn't have done Expedition Plastic Seas without all of the partners that you see here. So thank you to all of them. Now, Earth Echo does have some exciting new um, opportunities coming up. And the first of those is another virtual field trip with Ship to Shore and the Smith Ocean uh, Institute. So we will be exploring the deep sea and connecting live with their research vessel on Thursday, January 14th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We will also continue Earth Echo Expedition's Plastic Seas with a virtual field trip hosted by a, our 12-year-old, uh, Shalise Leesfield. And she is a young woman in Australia who is bringing significant awareness to uh, ocean plastic pollution there. She is showcased in our Earth Echo Expedition Plastic Seas videos as one of our youth action stories. So that field trip will be on Thursday, February 7th at 10.30 a.m., which is an Australian Eastern Dan Daylight Savings Time. So if you want to watch that one in the States, you can tune in actually on Wednesday night. We also uh, encourage all of you to follow along with our adventures at Earth Echo. You can follow us online, sign up for our newsletter, and follow us on social media as well. And again, we want to give a huge thank you to our sponsor, the Northrop Grumman Foundation. They sponsor our expedition program and also generously support Earth Echo International. So Megan, again, thank you so much for joining us and sharing all of your plastic knowledge with us today. I'd also like to thank Mrs. Goulet's class in Florida and Mrs. Tate's class in Michigan. And thank you again to everyone who's watching from home. And remember uh, to keep exploring. We'll see you soon.